wait a minute. Uh, um, I'm again, I'm about to say good morning, and then I have to remember it's not good morning. It's um, oh, wait a minute. I keep doing that. I apologize. I don't know why I keep doing that. All right, let's go there. OK, does that uh, is that seeable by everyone? Yep, good. OK, um, good morning or for you. Good afternoon, late afternoon. I'm looking forward to this topic today. Uh, it is discouraging that it's our last one. I've really enjoyed being doing these. I am looking forward to reading your white papers, which I guess I'll be doing later this month or early in July. As always, I really, really strongly recommend feel free to go to the ETS.org website and look at our research, look at our sample uh, assessments. Every assessment has examples of items. Uh, there's a lot of research reports in psychometrics and in uh, research on non-COG. I had mentioned earlier to some people today, um, one of our research people every year uh, at the NCME conference in the spring has an eight hour workshop just on non-cognitive assessments and all the psychometrics around it, which are fairly complicated. So today we're really looking at what I would call non-traditional assessments, uh, non-COGS, and I'll look at a couple of new assessments that we're working with with a university in, uh, as sort of an experiment in helping students expand not just their cognitive but their non-cognitive skills. Um, we just had a research done at ETS and the scientists found that oral and written communication, collaboration and problem solving are all in high demand uh, by employers, employees as well as um, uh, specific emphasis on the pairing of oral and written communication, critical thinking, and non-cognitive skills. So these are all relevant these days. Um, I'll give a brief overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about cross-cultural competencies because that's a good big part of what we're looking for in the workforce, and then talk about some new directions in assessment. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quickly because we have I'd like to keep it under 45 minutes so we have a good 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, but do feel free as I'm going through slides to send in questions and ask anything you want. So, and by the way, the name non-cognitive, there have been many, many other words, soft skills, um, I mean, things like that, because non-cog has a negative with a non, but that tends to be the most common word. But it's all kinds of things, teamwork, uh, goal setting, test taking strategies. I mean, there's a great number of different um, aspects to it, and they're all related. Uh, let me get there again. Um, here are some references. You have these slides, I believe, um, and so you can look at these resource uh, research papers. But it's all about values, attitudes, beliefs, personality. A motivation and a metacognition and self-knowledge. So a lot of non-cog skills assessments are formative there to help people recognize where they might improve. They're important to academic, to workforce. They're definitely valued by the workforce. And this PISA study shows that they're valued internationally across the globe. Um, there's a research reference at the very bottom here. Again, I, you don't need to write anything down because I think you have access to these slides, but there was, there's been studies to show that non-cognitive basically are better predictors of how people will do in the employment world. Um, now, to some degree, some uh, uh, competencies require cognitive, but mostly non-cognitive are more predictable than a cognitive for how people will do. I mean, I like to say it's a lot easier in general to teach somebody um, the knowledge than it is to change their attitudes towards the work. So these are why we use these for assessments. Um, so they're linked to achievement. The name there, Killinen, that first one, I work with him a lot. 
you will see his name around a lot of these uh, research studies at ETS. Uh, they do seem more modifiable, the second bullet, that is they can be taught. And they also predict other important outcomes better than cognitive. So traditionally it was, can you do math and reading and writing? And now it's okay, but there are a lot of other skills that are better predictors. Uh, this is just, uh, we're not gonna go through it, two pages of just all the kinds of uh, non-cognitive skills and how they're related to emotional intelligence, to personality, to behaviors, to everything. Um, they're also to academic, as I said earlier, metacognition, to acad uh, academic attitudes, and even around health. So these are more and more are seen as more and more essential to the workforce and to the academy. Now, measuring. You're going to see this slide here. It's going to remind you that the first day we talked, we talked about um, evidence centered design. And here we are. This is the same kind of issue. Why are we building this assessment and how will it be used? So the message I would keep giving throughout these three webinars, but at all times, don't just start building an assessment till you know what you're doing it for, why, how it's going to be used, who are the, the stakeholders, um, and that you can forget about if by mistake if you don't really remind yourselves that's essential. Um, what are the most important constructs? What's the context for this? Are you looking at future performance? Are you trying to change diversity? Are you trying to reverse adverse impact? Uh, Sabina sent me a whole thing on the kinds of training around gender uh, in the workforce. Uh, do you want to know what the best methods are? Um, and the third number here, how might we support the development of these through feedback, training, or other interventions? So this is really essential to realize, yes, we can measure non-cog skills as a kind of screening for the workforce, but it can also be part of the workforce as a way to increase the skill sets of the people who are already employed. So it does not have to just be a screening, it can be a training, a formative assessment. Um, we never got the first day to all those slides. I hope you look at them on your own on reliability, validity, and fairness. Reliability, I'm sure you all know, is a test consistency. Um, validity, is it measuring what should it measure? And we didn't talk about this much, but there's now it's more and more talking about consequential validity, which is, is the test ending up doing what it should do? That is increased diversity, better uh, academic success. Uh, that that really shows validity, um, what, what the result is of the test. And that's one of the things you wanna be looking at and statistically and uh, as the test is being given. Uh, traditionally, questions were these. I am responsible. I get along with others. I show up to work. The trouble with these Likert measures, and they're, they've been around a lot, um, is that they tend to bring out people. You know, if you say to me, do I work hard? I'm going to say yes, you know, whether or not I do. So it's if there's any kind of stakes or high stakes, especially, that you have the issue about faking. Um, also, people tend not to be extreme. It's interesting on surveys, if you say, how much did you enjoy this uh, presentation? People tend not to say it was awful or brilliant. They just tend to go somewhere towards the middle. There's also, which is interesting, a culturally based problem with response bias, which is that many people culturally don't say negative things in uh, this kind of environment. Um, and then if it's uh, Likert scale recommendation type things, there's the halo effect where you have an overall strong feeling about somebody. So you tend to just default to uh, strong on each separate skill, not really looking to see if the skills are different. You say overall he's good, so I'll just give a lot of good scores. Um, and so here, as I say, is where an employee is being rated and once you say he's responsible, you tend to just go with the uh, 
I'm sorry, same same ones all the way down. So once you say you strongly agree, you tend to do that rather than really thinking, well, yeah, he doesn't arrive to work on time. Everything else is good or he doesn't listen during meetings, but he is an effective contributor. The tendency is to have the halo effect is just to get the same scores. So there are non traditional methods and we'll look at a couple of these. Forced choice, we have a program called facets, which is a forced choice assessment. It is a uh, computer adaptive and in a relatively short time you produce scores in a series of personality traits. There are what we call SJT situational judgment tests. I think you've talked a lot uh, about performance tasks. Um, you know, bio data, basically behavioral consistency. There are a whole series of, of ones, including the eighth one down here, game based assessments, which we'll look really quickly at. We don't have time today to get into kind of game based assessments that are becoming uh, because of the technology and the availability of these games very common in assessment. And then there's what you might I think might relate to the assessors, the conversation based assessments. Forced choice um, is along these lines. The first one is you keep your promises or you are a forgiving person. And you say, OK, I, I agree, strongly agree. A forced choice, you have to make, you're forced to make a choice which is the most like you. Now, I'll be honest, when I take these tests, I don't enjoy it because often the whole point is you take two socially good or two socially bad attributes and ask which is the most like you. Uh, but people, it's hard to fake at that point because you, you can't choose both, you have to decide which is more descriptive. Um, for instance, if you ask an employee, are you a team player or are you a hard worker? It turns out hard worker is a better predictor of workforce success than team player. But that's the kind of thing that these tests are designed to assess. A situational judgment um, are scenario based. And the point about scenarios is that you can create an environment um, we've done situational judgment tests where we've made videos of professional actors playing roles and then having questions about that, which is sort of interesting. Or you can do it entirely in prose. You have, you can look at this one. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's a dialogue. What would be the one response that best helps your team move forward? And it sort of assesses people's ability to know how to interact with others in a workforce situation. Now I, we work for the medical school exam uh, for doctors uh, because it turns out doctors are not always good at empathy. They might be really brilliant um, biology majors or brilliant understandings of diagnoses, but they don't know how to talk to patients. So we went down and we filmed uh, actors playing the role of doctors and said, which of these ways of interacting is most appropriate? There's really an interesting approach to uh, assessment, but these are non-traditional methods. There's also performance based. Now I get the feeling you do a fair amount of that. Um, it's valid. The problem, and I said this the other day, you really have to work hard to standardize across participants. It's very easy for one assessor to help or not help in a different way from others. Another way to do it is to simulate um, a, an interaction and we'll look at a game uh, that's a folks popularly that does this. Um, with PISA, we developed a collaborative problem solving assessment in which you think you're collaborating with other people, but in fact you're collaborating with software. And that way there's no influence of you happen to have a good, strong or a weak partner. And then there are all these tasks you can give just to see about planning, time management. Um, and the third one, these executive functioning tasks are the kinds of things that many employers provide as training for internal already hired staff to help them do better. So it doesn't have to be, again, a screening. So we're going to look quickly across cultural competence, the three C's. Um, this is being seen as increasingly important. Globalization. Um, it's 
impossible to know what the kind of cultural interactions are. So how can you learn to? Um, I'm getting a bad network quality, so let me know if you're not hearing me. Um, any case, cross cultural is really considered important. And I was saying to someone earlier today, you we, we colleges really care about this a lot because many American students are very provincial. They come to a big university. It's the first time they've had to deal with people with different religion, different background, different ethnicity. And so it's something they want to teach and assess. Uh, it's generally defined as a set of knowledge, skills, attitudes developed through education, training and experience to allow you to perform effectively in any culturally complex environment. And it's any way that allows people to sort of understand their perceptions. And we'll talk a lot about perspective and perceptions today. Um, it's a hard to do this kind of work. Um, it's not clear exactly how to define the construct. Um, it's not asking, do you know the history or the geography? But it's, can you pick up patterns, make good reasoning? In fact, one of our international uh, intercultural competency assessments closely aligns with critical thinking. That is, can you interpret, decide, make good decisions based on what you're seeing? Um, in general, a lot of it is a uh, self report. You say, yeah, I've traveled a lot or I like people from different cultures. Uh, but the question is, how do you really assess whether they actually do have those skills? Uh, but remember, this is not saying, do you know the history of Japan or do you know what their cultural rules are in Tokyo about taking shoes off when you enter an apartment? They're about how can you observe, reason, and then know what you should do. So and a lot of these uh, situations we create are for non real cultures in which we just say, imagine a culture in which and see how well people can do it. Um, so defining it, um, we're going to look at number three at an employee at, at, at using a performance based measurement, but there's ways of uh, teaching it cultural. Number two, culture general recognition. Um, there are frameworks we can look at for heightened is one of our tests that does this and you'll see why there's that picture of these two people there in a minute. So we tried to define an assessment that's easy to implement. Hard to fake. Does not rely on self reporting. We developed a framework and when we did critical thinking the other day, I showed you a whole lengthy page of framework building. This is a kind of research that goes before we ever begin developing an assessment. And then we looked at ways to explore innovative methods to measure the constructs that we had previously identified in our framework, which is all part of the evidence center design. And then we developed summative and formative assessments. So that's just uh, this was a big project we did in research about two years ago. Um, we then looked at a literature review. We looked at all of the different kinds of uh, under the model prior experiences. Everything about culturally interacting, recognizing, hypothesizing, deciding, behaving, uh, learning how to manage one's own attitudes, which is hard. Um, and you can see a sort of silly cartoon about football versus soccer because the US has never learned to use football to describe what everywhere else in the world's called football. Um, so for this one test height and I mentioned height and critical thinking. And the reason I've been bringing up height a lot is because it's a, an assessment that we created very recently to meet sort of new needs in the academic world. And we defined a framework that had three qualities to intercultural and diversity, an approach an analyze and act. Uh, approach is simply can you tolerate ambiguity? Do you have positive cultural orientation? Self-efficacy, can you sort of get yourself where you need to be, do what you need to do? To analyze is to be aware of oneself, of other social situations, um, not judging, um, taking a perspective, um, and then knowledge and applying that knowledge. And then finally, probably most important, can you 
Do you have can you regulate your behavior and regulate your emotional interactions in a way that is uh, good in an intercultural environment? Um, this is a challenge because uh, you need to be able to re re recognize issues and be aware of cultures uh, in your own environment, but you also have to recognize what it is in others. And so we really made recognize the framework component that was in some ways the most challenging. We had goals to do a performance based task. We wanted it to be general, so you did not need to know any specific cultural history or politics. And when we worked on the PISA test, we had to be very careful because it could not privilege people who had a European awareness or a South Asian or a you know um, East Asian. The whole issue was, what can you do that's an awareness of cultural information could be meaningful and relevant? So there's visual recognition, identifying objects and photographs that represent different cultural dimensions. Um, we use the dimensions as a framework. We have cultural dimensions from various sources. Uh, we determined a set and we ended up with a seven dimensions that we defined as recognizing, uh, as being the kinds of skills you need in recognizing cultural, general cultural uh, elements. Uh, so here are some of these dimensions. Time, hierarchy and egalitarianism, private versus public space. This uh, relates number four to what Sabina was talking about. Gender and is that role defining? What is success? What is the political structure? And how are emotions expressed? So we came up with it, what we call a social simulator to create a set of cross-cultural challenges. And it's basically a game. And I, as I say, we would not have time today to actually set up the game and have you uh, play it, but I'll give you some scenes from it, some screenshots, but it was a way to create an environment that's not real, but in which there are real interpretations to be made about culture. So it was a game character. You make choices. There's such things as social practices. How do you talk, greet someone, ask for information? Um, how do you how, how do you interact with people? Are you helpful? Do you recognize deception or indifference? Um, and it has rich and flexible interaction. So this is like a platform, a game. Um, this is a kind of when we went on our first day, there are a lot of questions about technology. This is the kind of assessment that technology allows that you couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. Again, you can just take a quick look at this. It's a land called Ustrad. There's a host. You can interact with it. You can uh, choose how to interact with the person. Um, all of these have different cultural meanings based on the information that the test taker is given. You can see an interaction that came back negatively because the person, the test taker, chose an option that did not address this person formally. Um, as I say, there's a whole complicated game that goes with this, but you at least can get a feel for what it might look like. So we also did work with Heighten and we came up with the intercultural competency module um, to measure this. The trouble here, and this is one of the things, again, I said way back with uh, the you know first ideas of test design, we were given 45 minutes and that was it. Um, so for this test, it's not a game based one. It's a uh, written SJTs and Likert items, and it's based on a whole bunch of different kinds of questions about travel, about interacting with cultures you don't know, about comfort levels, and it all fit under those first three sub uh, domains we mentioned, approach, analyze, and act. In this test, if you go to ETS.org and look under all programs and then look for heighten, you can see actual questions on each of these. Um, 
We also work with PISA um, to measure basic and there the, the client wanted more knowledge and understanding about issues, specific skills like an empathy and critical thinking, attitudes. Um, these are 15 year olds who are taking it. We had a different kinds. This was a pilot, so it did not have any um, consequences. It was just more to see how we could measure it. And again, you can look into PISA. We don't, we do part of PISA, we don't own it in the sense that we own GRE. Okay, so let me get this now to where we're doing some new skills. We were asked by a university system, could we come up with some assessments that were not the typical reading, writing, and uh, uh, write, reading, writing, and math, but new skills that were really important in the university, and then of course also in the workplace. And these are based on a, they're, they're not basically non-cognitive, but they're connected. So we came up with three. Perspective taking, confirmation bias, and collaborative problem solving. And we had our test developers, it was last summer, create assessment for each of these. Again, following evidence-centered design, working with faculty, saying, what do you want? in a student who's taking your class in cultural history of China, or what do you want a student to do when interacting with other students? And what do you want students to do if they have a team assignment? So these were the things for each of these. We talked to faculty. We also talked with students. We piloted sample items, and then we um, actually administered the test last fall. And then we were going to administer it again this spring, but uh, the virus got in the way of this because they were being given in uh, computer labs on campus. But I assume we'll do it online this fall. Here's a couple of books um, that underlie some of the constructs. Uh, feel free to check these out. These are fascinating books about, you know, basically getting at, you know, cognitive dissonance and getting at what it means to. Uh, understand confirmation bias to understand perspectives. Um, they're all sort of strong ones. I hope some of you have ever seen the video that has the invisible gorilla that appears in a basketball game. It's a fascinating study that shows how people perceive things. It's all out of uh, cognitive science. I was at a conference uh, recently and this was one of the uh, slides it is really hard to engage with text that offends us and really easy to read with a text that supports our view of the world. Conversely, it is hard to undertake a critical reading of text that confirms our views and easy to be critical when we read text that we disagree with. Now, I don't want to overly focus on recent political events in the United States, but this quote right here from Jenks is a perfect description of the trouble a lot of people have in this country hearing the other side, understanding the other side. And in fact, people tend to be more and more limited in their understandings. We've done, they've done assessments where they've, um, I mean, not assessments, psychological tests where they give undergraduate students a series of uh, opinion pieces and they say these were written by Democrats. And people who are Republican think they're stupid. Then they say these were written by Republicans and Republicans think, oh, these are really good. And so the perception is if you start out with a bias, you don't even recognize you have, you're not able to read critically. And again, critical is, well, critical in that this is like critical thinking. Can you read texts that are not just supporting what you already think. So confirmation bias, uh, we assess by a selective response. Remember, we had to decide which one, um, what should we construct a response. We thought a lot about doing selective response, but instead, I mean, I mean doing constructive response and say, explain why you chose something. Um, 
The issue was logistics. We thought because of the scoring time and one of these assessments is constructive response. But to just remember, it can be done either way. If I were in a classroom, obviously I would do constructive response. Why did you choose this? What's your rationale? Humans uh, tend to defend their choices even when they're made arbitrarily. And this is an assessment that's designed to assess how willing test takers are to look at alternatives other than the ones they chose at random. So what's really interesting is if you just said to me, which do you like, A or B? And literally just A or B. And I say, well, I don't know, B. And then give me some information about A and B. I'm going to see what supports B, even though I didn't even choose it based on any reasoning at all. Um, and, and we ask this, and it's amazing to see how unwilling undergraduate students are to change. So one of the things we give is like, here's two kinds of cars, and we make up the names of the cars. Your father wants to buy a car, which one would you recommend? And you have to choose. Once you choose it, then we give you a set of uh, non-real URL sites that have pros and cons for each of the two cars. And, it turn, and you say, we say, you can only go to five of these sites. And it's amazing. Students all want to go to the sites that will simply confirm what they've already chosen, even though they chose it without any reasoning at all. Perspective, we did do constructive response. It's a scenario based. We gave the same stimulus. It's a lot like that situational judgment uh, scenario I showed you earlier, but even more complicated, lengthier. Um, and it presents two different characters in interacting. And each character comes from a different culture, different environment, and has different goals. And the test taker has said is required, okay, first take Joe's perspective, now take Mary's perspective to write two different essay. And the question is how well can you see a complicated issue from two different sides. And again, as with confirmation bias, it's remarkably difficult for students to be able to do that because once they start talking about Mary's side, they lose track of what it is that Joe might be. And the question is, are you capable of making those changes? And again, this obviously links very closely to the intercultural bias questions we've done. Um, on this one, we have a scoring guide. We've talked about that earlier. It's a four point scale. The construct is defined as flexibility and perspective taking. The presentation and distinctness of the two perspectives. How well ideas are connected and the attention to the goals and tasks, because in each scenario there's some complicated goals uh, that each character is interested in. Now notice on this one. There is nothing about grammar, mechanics, organization, because this is not in any sense assessing writing. It's purely perspective taking. Here's a score rubric for a four. Ability to discern coherent perspectives and choices of individuals by presenting them in terms of details reasonably inferred or provided. That's really important. Some are straightforward, some you have to have inferential reasoning. Um, and a typical response at a four level, flexibility, understanding how perspectives change, depending on how you look at the details, clear and reasonable perspectives and decisions and other individuals, coherent connections between the perspectives taken and the details provided or inferred, reasonably and coherent connections between perspectives and goals. So this is a very different kind of essay assessment. Um, we give a lot of assessments where we say, here's a stimulus, here's a passage, write your perspective on it. But, we, but at least I've never worked on one in which you said, take two different perspectives and write two different essays. The last one we did, which was also in PISA, is collaborative problem solving. Um, We've assigned four test takers to a single team. They don't know who each they are. They're all on computers. So each person's working anonymously. Um, and they're given the task of ranking three different options. And what happens, let me just see if we, uh, yeah, okay. So each team member is given some positive 
and some negative information about each of the options. But each team member has some information that the other team members do not. They're given a time limit. They're given a task, rank, order, three different options. Um, and uh, I repeated these team member paragraphs, sorry about that. But the idea is that I know, let's just say we're trying to choose which apartment should we rent for a house that's going to have the three of us or the four of us, I mean, on the team stay at. And some aspects of the house are good and some are negative, but I don't have all of it, the information. So I have to, on computer, in chat, interact with the other three people, one of whom says, no, no, you're wrong. We don't want that apartment. That apartment's got, uh, you know, too much noise outside it. But I don't know that it has too much noise, but I do know that it has lower rent. So we have to negotiate. Some of the information shared. We create these, and it was hard to do, such that once you have all the information, there's clear differences, clearly what the top three, uh, what the ranking of the three or should be. But the question is how quickly and how well can the team get to that point? Again, this is non-consequential, so we're just seeing how people do. We also read their chat to see, evaluate basically how are they cooperating. Now, as I said with PISA, where there are real things being measured, we did not want to have the effect that if you happen to have team members who are especially good or especially difficult to work with, that it wouldn't be fair. So in those cases, we've created software. So you type in the apartment has a really low rent and the software responds, but there's noise outside or whatever it is. So everyone gets the same information from the computer and we measure how well each does. Um, and I already went through that. A assessment experts also, the last bullet, look at the kinds of communication, leadership, team building. You know, do they say things like, well, that's stupid, or do they say, oh, that's an interesting point. What do you, person three, think? How well do they work together? And the limited time is important because the idea is you can't just collect every single piece of information, then they would be very easy. So I'm going to stop here. This is my just this one we're not going to get into, but where is assessment going? The ones I just mentioned are really new kinds of assessment. The game I showed you for measuring intercultural is a new kind of approach. Uh, the idea of using games. So the future of assessment, I would say, is informed by technology. Technology and technology. There's more work, focus on data analytics. We're doing a lot on keystroke analysis. We now can capture how people are interacting with the keyboard. Uh, there's eye tracking. Where are they looking in the passage? Um, we're doing new kinds of teachers assessments. We have a teacher assessment that has actual avatars of different students and the test taker, a future teacher, has to teach a lesson. The avatars, which has a live human actor playing the role says different things. So a student will say, well, I don't get it. What do you mean negative number plus a negative number is the same as a positive number um, or whatever? I mean, times a negative number. And how well does the candidate, the test taker, interact? A lot more we're looking at formative assessments and learning technologies, and that's becoming of increasing importance at ETS. And then what you guys know more than I do, workforce skills. So with that, um, I'm a little bit early, but we have 18 minutes of questions. No, it's oh, brilliant. We have, we have great, great questions. questions. Um, actually, actually it's it's us, us. We, we, we talked about a cognitive assessment. I want to ask, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? Am I echoing? Because I'm hearing an echo. I'm not hearing the echo. Oh, wonderful, then that's fine. So it might just be on my side. So anyway, last week we talked about non-cognitive cognitive assessments. And this week too, we're definitely extending the idea of what a non-cognitive assessment is. So while we talk of performances, how are these non-cogs different from the non-cogs we talked last week? What's the clear distinctions you can draw in these between the two? Well, okay, I'm, I have to think for a minute. Which non-cogs last week are we drawing? We talked about 
we talked about non cognitive assessments last week, which so were very performance based. We were still talking about performance. We talked okay. about workforce stuff, but that was also non cog technically. And so are these. How do you distinguish between the okay. two, especially that, for your test development? Yeah, OK, I, and I didn't get that at first. OK, so I would say this when we talked about performance assessment, let's say driving a car or welding two pieces of metal or rewiring a, a house. That's performance. And I would say the construct is a skills. It's not a non cog. When we talk about non cog, we're really talking about things like personality, teamwork, more psychological. Performance doesn't mean non cog. Now, it could be non skills uh, in the sense of yes. academic skills, but asking somebody, uh, measuring somebody on how well they do a dive in the Olympics or drive a car or give a speech. Those are all very specific constructs based to, in many cases, to employment, but they're not what I would call, what I am what I am calling non-cog. The non-cog skills are things like leadership, um, cultural awareness, um, collaborative problem solving, perspective taking. Those are things that are not like, this makes you a better plumber directly. They're related to it, but they're not. So I, I would separate those. So I may have said something was performance. I didn't mean non-cognitive. Oh, yeah. yeah. So That's I would say one. being able to um, uh, drive a car is not a non-cog skill. It's not an academic skill. It's a mm. specific car driving skill. <laughs> does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Um, it really helps. Um, they, we'd love to see now PISA is always considered a cognitive test. What kind of non cognitive items were inserted in the PISA? Was something similar done for the OECD and the PIAC test? And how are these cognitive and non cognitive items balanced in assessments by test development by okay. test developers like so? Sure. Like how do you balance? How do you even get to that? Yeah, and I'll be honest. I worked on the cultural um, intercultural skills test for PISA just because I was working on it. I've never done overall work on PIAC or PISA, so I don't know with the OECD. My guess though, and I'm pretty sure they don't inter twine them. That is, there's this, you know how there can be a section on math and then a section on reading. The non-cog, it's not like you slip a non-cog question in among the math questions. Uh, you would have a different section, which would be the non-cog. So the cross-cultural competency was given as a separate section. The collaborative problem solving was given as a separate section. It wasn't combining collaborative problem solving with uh, quant or math or writing. So they're not balanced within each other. They're separate sections. Then the question becomes, OK, if you're giving a test for a future some employment, do you want to see do they have quant literacy? Then do you want to see if they have verbal literacy? And now do you want to see if they have good non cognitive skills for working in the workforce? Do you see it? So it's not the balance would be what are you trying to measure? But but it's mm -hmm. not like one test would have both questions. One section would have both questions in them. Does that that work? I mean, w like when you're getting yeah. a math test, we don't slip in a reading comp. We separate the That's section true. so that you know what. Yeah, you're now doing math. Now there are tests and we used to have one for student learning outcomes where you had a couple math questions and a couple verbal questions that tends to be unfair to the test taker in part because okay. it just is adding non what we call construct relevant difficulty, which is switching suddenly from math to verbal back to math again. We would separate mm -hmm. the section say OK, now you have a section on uh, situational judgment test items measuring your teamwork or whatever it is we're measuring. Gotcha. You actually mentioned in your presentation about how you were measuring doctors for their empathic skills. Now we have a similar situation here, so can we have an example from there that you could probably apply to an, a question that came up here? For example, that how do you design an assessment for say a machine operator who's not very educated? So doctors are on the higher end of the spectrum and they perform large. They're doing these largely performative tests, you know, tasks like 
welding and putting the machine together, doing the basic maintenance. How do you start ha developing items to test their soft skills like adaptability, teamwork or responsibility? Or is that or are there different ways we can think of the items for that kind of a group? Well, I would say the forced choice assessments that I talked about could be given mm -hmm. to any employment and it measures general uh, what used to be called grit or you know hard work or mm -hmm. persistence but you get scores in persistence teamwork leadership you can get those personalities measured in a purely non-cognitive forced choice assessment or with that game-based one you could do if you want to measure ability to interact with culture now the doctor test is separate that was measuring a very specific skill, which is empathy. Uh, because mm -hmm. the feeling was you could have some very, very highly skilled surgeons who don't know how to talk to children. So mm -hmm. for instance, we wrote a series of scenarios which turned into small movies. And I wrote one, at that point, my oldest daughter was nine years old and she had had some kind of growth on her arm and she had to go to a doctor who had to have her basically have a small surgery to have it removed. So I wrote a scenario saying, when the girl says, a nine-year-old girl says to the doctor, can I be, will I die? You know, something like that. How should the doctor respond? And then we filmed one doctor saying, oh yeah, you might. Another doctor saying, not at all, don't worry, dear. Uh, another one saying, maybe you have a 73.21% chance. Each of these was then seen as, well, what do you really say to a nine-year-old girl who's asking if this mm -hmm. surgery is dangerous? Now, what's hilarious about this example is when I went down to Washington, D.C. to the medical council uh, to show the examples, and a bunch of us did this, and I had my own little team, and a team of expert doctors was sitting around a table, and we read this scenario, and one doctor said, you would never tell her she could die, right when another doctor said, you have to tell her she can die. So there's not always agreement. And that's one of the things you have to find out. You have to make sure there are correct <laughs> answers to these questions. The, the doctors did not agree at all. So we threw, threw that sample out. It's like, that's not gonna work. The doctors can't agree what's the right thing to say. But that's the point. Um, that's part of, that's what we do with pilot testing. We find out, maybe we think we're measuring this. And I thought it was a good question. I thought it was, clear you, you say something nice to the kid it was my daughter after all but yeah. in fact they didn't agree with that so that's part of it but in any case to go back to it somebody who's mainly doing um, welding and construction and all that you can still see are do they work hard are they persistent that would be a skill you also could say i want somebody who can read blueprints that would be a different skill mm -hmm. yep. you could also say i want somebody who can tell me why it's not working so you can measure oral communication skills. Each of those would be a construct yeah. that if your job analysis says, I need the engineer to be able to explain to the manager, then that's something you can measure. But if it turns out you don't mm -hmm. need to explain it, you shouldn't measure that because that's construct irrelevant. Got it. With all of this, you want your, what we call SMEs, your subject matter experts, and with jobs, it's yeah. the people in the, you talk to the employers and you talk to the employees and you find out, and when you are gonna try out the test, you give it to the employees that you don't know mm -hmm. are good or bad and see if you can identify who are the good or bad ones and go back to the managers and say, this person did really well on the test. If the manager says, yes, he's one of our best people, great. If he says, but he's not one of our good people, then you know you're not, assessing what it is you need to assess. And that's where the interactions with the experts, whether it's faculty or employees or whatever stakeholders, those are the people who have to basically validate what it is you're assessing. Exactly, um, and, and this is something that we love a little more detail on. So you've seen how we in India through NSDC have kind of tried 
we try to kind of pin down constructs of social emotional skills and even gender competencies. Like how is your workforce, is your workspace gender cognizant? Is Do you have the social emotional skills to be present? So we've tried to establish it for a very Indian context. Now, when you look at how Highton has done it and how ICD and the 3C competency theory works, and this is a very Indian way of kind of adapting and saying the same thing. How do you think we could strengthen those con constructs and what kind of items do you recommend when you're testing and testing concepts that are so hard to pin down? I'm thinking very particularly for all those performances or the, all those kind of workforce that require a lot of customer interaction that re require you to go outside of yourself and interact with a lot of people. So you need to be all the more careful of your emotions, of your social context, of what your gender or cultural biases are. So no, those are really good. By the way, I, I meant to tell you two days ago, the New York Times had a page a major article on women in employment in India during the COVID-19. Uh, it was a very discouraging article, but it was an interesting one you might look for. Mm -hmm. But um, so again, I think if the construct is, can this person demonstrate gender awareness? you would yeah. set up a series of questions of either, again, there are all these different ways of measuring it. To me, the most straightforward and efficient one would be a situational judgment test that selected yeah. response, because mm -hmm. that way you don't have to interview anyone or observe them or um, score uh, essays. If you have the ability, the best way, of course, would be to put them into a situation and see how they do have them. I mean, but that would be the most difficult to create a standardized assessment, but that would be remember I mentioned the one that has more ecologically sound, but it's hard to standardize, but you could do a situational judgment. Uh, a yeah. person comes into the room. Uh, he says the following or she says the following or if you're measuring transgender, you'd probably have a XE says the following, whatever it is mm -hmm. and which of the following would be an appropriate response? And at least you can measure whether they know what's appropriate. Keeping in mind yeah. that you say to me, should you, uh, here's a true or false question, should you cheat on assessments? I would go, oh no, that doesn't mean I won't cheat. So you won't have a guarantee that they'll actually do that. Yeah. At least you can find yeah. out, you can yeah. find out, do they know what they should be doing? That's a start which is appropriate. So we have yeah. sexual harassment um, uh, training every year and it's required every single year if we take the same assessment again and it gives a bunch of videos of people of professional actors interacting and then within each case it's which of the following is the appropriate response in this situation and it shows how well you can look at people and see past your prejudices because it's very easy to get fooled into just saying, oh, I think the white male should be uh, promoted because you're just so used to saying that or whatever it is. So you can actually measure it with scenarios, either verbal, I mean, written ones or videotape ones or that game I gave, I showed you could create a game environment in which you have to interact with these people. The difference here, though, the game one, we're trying to create something that is not real in a sense. These aren't real people, whereas I think what you would want in this case would be real gender differences. So there'd be just does a person always call on the female, I mean, the male avatar first? That would be something you could measure. Um, and so that would be again, you'd want, but you want to start. What is it we're measuring? What is it we want to know about it? And what are we going to do once we know this? All those questions you have to answer before you start building the test. I don't see you on the screen, Samina. Did Sabina drop off? Oh, there, there she is. Uh, sorry, I had dropped off, my yeah. bad. My no, so so what I'm saying is I think you can definitely do it with situational judgment would probably be the best way to do it and have difficult situations in which if you end up always choosing the male avatar mm -hmm. 
or the male actor or the male in the description, um, it would show an innate uh, gender bias that you're trying to correct for. And again, you'd, you'd want to decide, is this something that's formative, in which case you would say, OK, you seem to have this. We're going to work on helping you go beyond it. Or is it something that would determine who you hire? And those stakes yeah. would be higher. And, and that's the kind of thing you have to decide. So th there's another really great question um, that came from the audience. So today, so um, in, in India, we actually rely heavily on assessors, on individuals who go out there and interact with people because of the lack of literacy and obviously the lack of outreach or, you know, right. penetration of technology around. So we do rely on our, our honestly, our assessors are our foot soldiers. So yep. um, do you think it is actually a valid way of conducting these kind of non-GOG assessments and having separate individuals doing these technical assessments who are doing the observations, who are doing even the assessment center type um, uh, assessments and um, and doing soft skill assessors separately. People who are more attuned to uh, confirmation bias, to selective bias, all those things. Is there a logic? Is there a rationale that you might think but because of a country like India, where we might have these other barriers to standardizing this, that our assessors can be trained to go out and do these and test for these things and I report think, back with the scoring and the rubric or something like that. Yeah. The answer is, uh, you know, not the it depends, though it does a little bit, but the main point is it has its own challenges. It's not yeah. that they're insurmountable. And so you would want to err on the side of really making sure the assessors were trained and standardized and mm -hmm. somebody observed the assessors assessing somebody to see if they were in fact performing in the way you want. And it would help to do what we call inter-rater reliability checks. Yeah. So that would mean some percentage, 10% against all logistics yeah. and money where a different assessor would assess the same person. And we, yeah. it, you get the same results. If you do, there's some suggestion of reliability. If one person says this is a great person to hire and another person says this is the worst person to hire, something's not going correct. And that's true for written assessment, um, any kind of constructive response, any kind of performance. Now, we've all watched the Olympics and every time yeah. somebody dives, one person gives it a nine, somebody else gives it a six. They're pretty close, but sometimes they're pretty far apart. And sometimes, yeah. guess what? The U.S. judge gave the U.S. diver a higher score than the Chinese judge did. Mm. So you have to look, are there biases with the assessor? Does the assessor just tend not to hear what the woman says very well because uh, he is so convinced that it should be a he that he hires? So you have to train, look for patterns, evaluate it, or, and see what's happening. If somehow every single employee turns out to be male from a certain background, you'd be yeah. kind of suspicious something's going on here and that would speak to your training and to how well you're checking into whether if a woman were the assessor, do you get different results and that kind of thing. So yes, the answer is sure, you can do this, but it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it's, uh, it's not that it's not valid, but you have to demonstrate the reliability you can't have validity without reliability. Mm. That's wonderful. I actually want to ask a little bit of an iffy question and you can obviously say no if you don't know the answer to this one, but we wanted to know if it's not too intrusive, how expensive was it to develop the Vox Populi social simulator? I mean, it looks like there was a lot of gamification that went into that. And so far, how many people have used it and what trends have emerged? I mean, because I think it's been implemented largely in the states? Yes, and so the answer is uh, not, uh, is really I don't know. It was done yeah. as a research, so we have a huge research group at ETS. Mm -hmm. Because we're nonprofit, we can uh, do that because we're not trying to mm -hmm. just make money. So if we make some money on one test, we use it to do research to build better ones and more and new tests. So I don't know, I mean, it'd be hard to figure out how many people spent how many hours. Somebody must have a budget. I just wasn't on the budget part of that. So a, a program yeah. like that, the research group would say, 
I, somebody in the group would say, I have this idea to build a game that measures in a culture. And they would say, we'll give you funding of, I'll make this up, $100,000, which is measured by you get paid so many dollars an hour, which means you can put, I'm just making this all up, uh, 1,500 hours of time into this project. So there is a budget. I just don't know what it is for this specific game, but it's part of a whole gamification effort in the research department. So it wasn't okay. just this one game. They're building a whole series of different games. They're testing them out. I don't think any of these have hit anything like wide distribution. I think they're all in the piloting experimental stage. Now the high intercultural is operational, but notice that's the one that just had a 45 minute multiple choice selective response assessment yeah and that's out in the field and that took us less than a year and a half probably from conception to uh, field testing pre pot well we did pilot testing and then field in fact we did cognitive labs then field testing then pre-testing and then it became operational um, the games i think are still more in the experimental stage so and, and it's a lot of work to create these but so, the technology is getting that, no. yep. Yeah, yeah, because that's exactly it. That was going to be my next question. I mean, what do you see happening? So we know that gamification is becoming a big part of learning and assessing technologies, but what is the bigger buzz on them? Like, what are you hearing and what is ETS kind of focusing on, on the learning technologies, on the workforce skills? Like, where are you seeing, where are you seeing the movements in, in larger, strides like where are the largest strides i guess that's what i'm asking i, I think the Especially, biggest I mean, can you, yeah with the virus things are changing so rapidly and so dramatically that right now a lot of different um, testing companies and educational companies are trying to figure out how can we teach in a world in which you don't have people sitting in a classroom next to each other and you think about elementary school where so much of it is get in little groups of three and they're all talking yeah. to each other and now suddenly they have to be six feet apart you know like a, a six-year-old that's gonna be really hard so yeah. to answer your real question is people are thinking really long and hard about how to change learning technologies um i'm old enough i can remember when they first had self-directed math books where you just went on your own pace and as soon as you got yeah. finished the chapter, you took your own test. And that was considered new technology because the teacher didn't have to teach everyone in the class the same math uh, concept at the same time. But the teacher would walk around and help those individually who are struggling. Well, now that can all be done with computers. It can be done online, but it can also be boring. And so when I, uh, years ago, I taught in rural Maine, I mean, a really rural area and I taught gifted kids in elementary school. And at that point, mm -hmm. there was a new game called the, uh, um, the uh, what's it called, Oregon Trail. And it was about the pioneers who went across the United States in the uh, 19th century on wagons. And the game was all about teaching kids how to balance supplies, because you were limited to how many supplies in terms of money and weight that you could put in the wagon, right? So your idea was to put in some food, <laughs> flour, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Well, guess what? Yeah. Every one of my kids did nothing but load it up with rifles and ammunition so they could shoot the buffalo because they thought that was cool. Um, so <laughs> no, none of them packed flour. They didn't care. They didn't, you know, I'd say, but you're not going to make it across. Who cares, Mr. Baldwin? I get to shoot a lot. And so games you got to watch what, what happens with the games, but that's yeah. the kind of thing people are looking at in learning technologies. You want to make sure they're actually doing what it is you're hoping they'll do, um, which doesn't always. Yeah. Wow, that, that's, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, and so that's part of the gamification group is trying to find things that are motivated and that give feedback. And and by the way, we have workforce gamification where you yeah. basically somebody comes up to you and says, I'm really mad at him. He didn't make his deadline and you're the team leader and she's asked, what should you say back? And they have to do yeah. that to see, are they any good at this? See, yeah. I mean, see, I'm, I'm going to go off of that because there's another question that came in and talked about more about diagnostics. Is there a way 
that um, I mean, and this is something that would actually go back to test design. Is there a way that we can design a diagnostic so that the non cock um, competencies uh, that we've kind of discussed here, which are very behavioral, very mindset oriented, can actually say that you are better suited for ABC kind of performance from performative or workforce roles or for this kind of occupations. Has that sort of a thing happened with ETS? Are there tests like that out there? And would you recommend any? I don't know, but if you're saying you take a test that then says you would be good at being a barber, yeah. you'd be good at being a teacher. No, there are such tests all over the place. Online, you'll find them. Yeah. ETS would feel very uncomfortable standardizing anything that labeled people towards professions. And the risk would be, what if all the women were assigned to be housewives or uh, waitresses yeah. and all the men were assigned to be executives and lawyers? You would worry about that. Um, it, it, in other words, it's really you want to be careful. So, so far, no, we've done workforce. This person shows these uh, personality characteristics. Strong leader, uh, not a good team player, hardworking, whatever it is. But we haven't mm -hmm. said your specific skills are. Now, I've seen, not from ETS, other companies where you can take a series of assessments to see what your skills are and where you might likely want to go for employment. And the OECD mm -hmm. does a lot of that and labels different kinds of jobs. We aren't doing that now, but that is something that other companies are doing and other agencies are definitely doing it, which is trying to find, you know, trying to line people up with uh, uh, employment specific uh, careers. We don't do that. OK, so I'm going to ask a question that I am I personally a little uncomfortable with. Do you think IQ tests have a place? in uh, for workforce candidates and 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 do they have a place in this kind of assessment design, especially for non cog maybe even cog? Well, OK, so there's a couple of things. IQ per se, really people don't use in outside of um, elementary school and even there <laughs> it's highly controversial. I think somebody once told told me in a class an IQ test is a perfectly accurate measure of how well you did on that IQ test. <laughs> That's all it tells yeah. It doesn't do anything else. Now, gen what they call G skills, general knowledge skills, there are mm -hmm. a lot of employment tests around that. Um, yeah. There's a test, I forgot, I suddenly can't think of the name of it, that's like seven minutes long that even the National Football League players take, and it's oh. all about speededness, um, and it's used in employment agencies. For years, there was a Myers-Briggs analogy test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. gave yeah. up. We gave it up because we said it wasn't valid or reliable. And of course, it makes more money than ETS makes altogether. I mean, it. Is, <laughs> yeah. We, 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 could, we, we couldn't stand behind it. So we're very conservative about that. But having said it, definitely what I would call not IQ, but quantitative literacy and verbal literacy and document literacy are all assessments that are used for low level employment screening. So you mm -hmm. want somebody who can at least follow directions, at least read a graph or a chart, at least do very simple math. That could be perfectly legitimate. That's not an IQ per se. It's specific constructs of math, reading and reading documents. Um, yeah. And we have an adult literacy test called PDQ, which was, you know, basically documents and uh, quant and prose, and it was to measure those three skills. And yeah. it was used as a screening. Um, there are other workforce screening tests in cognitive, that is in basic, yeah. basic literacies. And separately, we've used the forced choice assessment as a screen for non-cognitive personality traits. And that also seems we can stand behind that for validity. The word IQ, though, you just, you just don't hear that anymore for beyond like uh, the K-12 schools. And even there, I used mm -hmm. to use uh, an IQ test as a screen for identifying students to put into gifted classes. Um, yeah. But it's not used for employment at all. 
But again, you have to be careful because if the job you're hiring is to be a sweeper and you give an IQ test or even a literacy test that measures skills that you don't need in order to be a sweeper, then you run into a lot of legal questions, at least in the US, because you can't keep people out of a job for not having skills you don't need. And things like firefighter, firefighting is a very, I don't want to say lucrative, but it's a fairly prestigious job. And a lot of the tests are ones that really measure purely physical strength, which tend to privilege men. And it turns out that cooperating women are much more efficient at getting people out of burning buildings than heroic single men trying to be heroes. Um, and so it turns out that what they were measuring wasn't the right thing. <laughs> and so you really want to be careful because you, you'll tend to measure that which you think you're good at. <laughs> so there, that's why you need to have on your test committees people from wide variety of cultural, gender, race, religion, uh, geography, everything, because people will be in a mindset, talk about confirmation bias, or mm -hmm. guess what? They think people who are like them are people who are going to be good. And it's not, they're not doing it unconsciously, they're doing it subconsciously. So that's yeah. why you need to have committees made up of people and really make sure, okay, is that really what a firefighter needs? Or is it just that we like thinking of firefighters as big, strong men? And so we're going to give tests to see if they're big, strong men. Um, so with all of this, you want to be very, very careful. Brilliant. I think people are more suddenly one really interested in the PDQ test, um, especially the adult literacy test. So we might just um, if you have any resources about that, do share that with us. OK, um, yeah, so I mean, we'll definitely circulate it among those who are interested, but I think we're we we are definitely out of time today. We've gone a good amount and thanks a bunch. It's been great. This has been very, very informative and amazing. Rekha, Bhumika, if you have anything to say, that'll be now's the time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sabina, and thank you, Doug, for uh, such a such a, that that was really an interesting session for all of us. We had some very very interesting questions coming in, and the entire series have been really enriching experience for us, interacting with you and knowing about what ETS things and how are the processes built and what are the certain uh, you know, uh, robustness in the process that is uh, talked about. So uh, really helpful there. And with that, we are coming to the end of our uh, series of interactions. Uh, it was uh, great and thanking you once again, Doug, we'll keep our conversations going on. Uh, there's so much of uh, so much interesting material you have shared with us that we have made sure that it has gone to all the participants who were registered with us. Um, um, on that note, uh, we'll uh, end this event, okay. and uh, we look forward to interacting with you with you, uh, you know, on the assessment processes separately. Um, yes. Thank you. And if you feel comfortable, let Nancy uh, Siegel know that you've got what you wanted because I'm doing this for her, and it would help me for her to know that. Definitely. Wonderful. Great. All right, and then I'll look forward to hearing from you about the white papers. Deal. Yes. All right. Yes. Have a good All evening. Right. I'm going to have my second cup of coffee. <laughs> Start my day. <laughs> have a good day, Doug. Bye. All right. Thank you. Yep. Bye. bye.